Here's a brief overview of section 1.3. Section 1.3 is probably the most significant section in this whole chapter because it introduces the calculations for especially compound interest, which we'll talk about in a second. And most of what we do through the rest of the chapter is variations on compound interest in different ways of paying back loans, for instance. So you can read the introduction to this section, but pretty quickly you'll run into the descriptions of simple and compound interest. And back in section one, we talked about the basic concept of interest and how it's uh, essentially a fee that you're paying for the privilege of holding on to some money if you take out a loan. So simple interest is pretty easy to calculate. Basically, it's just a percentage of the principal, the amount that you borrow. And so you'll see a formula in a minute for simple interest, but you just calculate whatever percentage the interest is of the principal and then multiplied by however many years that loan is taken out. So the interest is calculated just on the principal. Compound interest is a little bit different. Instead of just calculating interest based on the principal, in this case, the interest from one year or one month, if we're doing things monthly, is added on to what you owe. So for instance, if you borrowed $100 at 10% interest, at the end of that year, you would owe 10% of $100 or $10 in interest, and that would get added to your balance. So at the end of that year, you would now owe $110. And then the following year, you would accrue 10% of that new higher balance. So the second year, you'd actually owe $11 in interest. So at the end of the second year, you would owe a total of $121, and so on. And so this would go year by year or month by month in whatever case you're looking at, and the interest each year gets added onto your balance. So that's compound interest, and compound interest grows much quicker than simple interest. Compound interest is uh, much more common. It's the one that most uh, loans in the real world are based on. So you can read a simple description of, of simple interest, and then you'll see this formula. That's the simple interest formula. I equals PRT. P stands for the principal, the amount you borrow. R is the interest rate. Remember that when you're multiplying things like this in a formula, interest rate R should be expressed as a decimal. So a 5% interest rate would be 0 0.05, for instance. And then T is the number of years, or if it's monthly interest, then you can have the T be the number of months, and you can work similarly for other. So that's the calculation for calculating interest itself, but I've given you another formula here down below, which is the future value. And we talked about future value back again in section 1.1. It's basically a way of lumping together two calculations. If you can calculate the interest and you know how much you borrowed, the future interest is just how much you borrowed plus the interest that you owe. So that's basically how much you have to pay back at the end. If you borrowed $100 and over time $15 of interest accrued, you would owe a total of $115. So all you do to find the future value is you add them together, but it turns out you can write one line, one formula that captures all of that all at once. So this is a handy formula for not just answering how much interest accrued over time, but immediately jumping to how much you owe in the future, F, based on a starting balance, P. You'll see this with compound interest as well, and with several other types of loans, where we have a formula involving F, the future value, and P, the present value. Now what you'll see as we do examples is that we can work in either direction. Either we can be given the value of P, we can be given the initial loan amount, and the interest rate and the time, and asked to calculate F, the future value, in which case we just plug everything into this formula, multiply everything out, and we get the answer for F. Or we could be given a different question where we're told what F is. In other words, say we are taking out a loan and we want to know how much we can borrow today 
based on how much we'll be able to afford to pay back in the future. In that case, if we know the value of f and we want to solve for the value of p, then we can work backwards using this formula. And we'll have to do one step of algebra to solve for p, where we'll divide by everything in parentheses after we plug it in. So you'll see those two kinds of examples throughout this section. Each time we have a slightly different formula, we'll talk about the formula for compound interest. It'll look similar in that we'll have p and f for present value and future value. And when we do what's called continuous compound interest, we'll have the same kind of thing, where we'll have f and p. And in each case, we'll have examples where we're given p and asked to find f, or given f and asked to find p. So both directions we'll need to be able to work in and solve for either one of those unknowns. So you'll see examples of each kind. So you can read through, there's an example of just calculating interest by itself, given a principal interest rate and length of time. You can follow along with that. And then, as I said, there's one where you're given the present value. This time you're making a deposit, but it's the same idea. You deposit a principal at a given interest rate, and you're told how long this deposit sits there, and you're asked to find the future value. So you're given the present value and asked to solve for the future value f. Then in the next example, it gets flipped. Now you know how much money you want to have in the future. In 18 months or in one and a half years, you want to have $12,000. So the question is, how much should you deposit now? In other words, what's the present value you need to deposit in this account in order to build up to that future value? So you can run through this calculation and see how it works that you set up the formula in the same way, but now you have to do one step where you divide by what's in parentheses to solve for the value of p. And so you can see those two examples, and again, if you need to, you can watch the videos on those examples in detail. You can try these similar ones to make sure that this clicks and you can do the calculations yourself. Then we move on to compound interest. And you can read this description. It gets a little bit detailed and it's easy to get lost in the details here, but the basic concept that's going on here is that idea that if we start with a certain balance on our account, and we calculate the interest owed for that year. So that would be at 8% interest, you would owe five, uh, $400 in interest for that first year. So at the end of the first year, or at the beginning of the second year, your balance would have risen to 5,400. So now when interest is calculated, it's also calculated based on not just the amount you borrowed, but the interest that was added to it as well. So you notice as you go through this table, that the interest that you owe each year starts to go up as your balance goes up. So compound interest grows the balance much faster than simple interest does. And you'll see that in an example here. I'll jump ahead to this one. We're comparing in green what happens with compound interest, what happens to the balance on the account, versus simple interest. Simple interest grows in a straight line. Compound interest grows in this curve that starts to increase very quickly. And we call this kind of growth exponential growth, and we'll talk more about that in chapter two. But it grows much quicker because the interest is being calculated not only on what you borrowed, but also on the interest that's being earned as time goes on. Here's the formula for compound interest. Again, it looks very similar to the simple interest one. It's a little bit more complicated Notice this exponent here where you're taking one plus r over n and then all of that in parentheses raised to the power of n times t. But otherwise the pieces are all the same other than this introduction of n and n is how many times per year the interest gets added onto your account. So it could be at the end of the year that they calculate your interest and add it to the account or it could happen at the end of the month or at the end of the week or whatever time period is decided on, but whatever that is, however many times per year that happens, that's n. So I have a table over here that you may find helpful. If interest is compounded annually, that means it happens once per year, semi-annually is twice per year, and so on. Monthly is 12 times per year. That's probably the most common 
that you'll see. And then you might see weekly, that's 52 times per year, and so on. So otherwise, the formula has all the same pieces in it. P stands for present value, F stands for future value, R stands for interest rate, and T still stands for how many years there are. So even if the interest is compounded monthly, T is still going to represent the number of years, and N will take care of the fact that it's compounded monthly. But otherwise, the formula has the same kind of structure, and you can still solve two types of problems. One where you're given the value of P, and you want to solve for F. You would do it the same way we did with simple interest, plug everything into the right side of the equation, and multiply everything together. Or you could be given the value of F and asked to solve for P, you would again figure out what all the rest of this is, the 1 plus r over n to the power of nt, and then you would divide both sides by that number to solve for p. And you'll see examples of that, both cases, as we go forward. So here we have an example where we're given the value of p and everything else, and asked to solve for the future value at the end of 20 years, which we can do. Then later on, you'll see an example where you have the future value given. You know how much you need in 18 years, and you want to know how much do we need to deposit now in the present to do that. And so again, you plug everything in and solve for P. So the process is just the same as what we did with simple interest. It's just a different formula with slightly different details, but the process works out the same. Make sure you read through and understand uh, how to use your calculator to solve for exponents. Your calculator may be slightly different. Make sure that you can do those calculations and you can follow through again the videos and the triads to practice that. There are a couple of other uh, minor things to pay attention to. I have a little mention here on rounding. Just be careful when you're rounding numbers as you calculate something because those rounding errors tend to grow as uh, you go through the process of the problem. So try to show as many decimal places as possible in your intermediate answers as you use one number to calculate another. And I have an example here of what happens if you round too early, that your, your error uh, starts to grow. So just be careful with that, especially on the homework. It can be a little picky with rounding errors. Um, on a test where you're showing me your work, I can read between the lines a little better and follow along. Um, I have an example here of comparing two interest rates with different compounding periods. All you're doing is just calculating the amount that each one of them earns to compare them. So there's nothing really new there. It's just an application of that compound interest formula. This is a side note that you can read if you like, but it's not something that we'll need to worry about in detail. The last main concept in this section is continuously compounded interest. And the idea is that compound interest grows faster than simple interest, but it turns out that it also depends on how often you compound interest. If you compound it yearly, it'll grow quickly. If you compound it monthly, it'll grow actually a little bit faster. If you compound weekly, it'll grow a little bit faster still. If you compound daily, it'll grow a little faster still because that interest that you're adding along the way has more time to grow if you don't wait to the end of the year to add the interest in. If you add it in right away at the end of the month, or right away at the end of the week, or at the end of the day. And the difference is, is, is small, but it's there. So the question is, is there some kind of limit? And it turns out there is. There's a limit to how fast compound interest can grow, and the limit is what we call continuously compounded interest, which you can basically think of if interest is compounded every instant, like every millisecond, or something like that, or even every second, it would be pretty close to what this turns out to be. So this is the limit, and the amount of interest that gets added each second would be very, very tiny, but over time, the impact would grow. And I have a little table here showing you what happens as the value of n increases as you start to compound faster and faster and faster. So if n is 10 million, that means it would compound 10 million times per year, which is very, very fast. But what you notice is that basically this number starts to come up in your formula. And it turns out that that number is a special number that shows up in lots of applications, and we call it e, 
So e is this special number, just like pi, if, you, if you're familiar with that. It's the same kind of idea. It's a number that shows up often enough that we make a special name for it and reserve the letter e to represent that. So it turns out that the formula, if you're doing continuous compound interest, you have a slightly different formula than for regular compound interest. So it's important in these compound interest problems that you pay attention to whether it's sort of regular compound interest compounded yearly or monthly or weekly or something, or whether it's continuous compound interest, in which case you would use this completely different formula. So watch out for that. This E, you could just type in your calculator 2.71828, for instance, or your calculator will have a, a button for E, and you can find it on the TI-83, for instance, using this note here. Or you can find it on your calculator if you have a different one. Uh, the value of E is stored there, so you can use that. And you can follow through the examples and look at the videos. They'll show how to use the calculator to find E for those things. But otherwise, you still have R, the interest rate, T, the number of years, and P for the present value, and F for the future value. You can work the same kind of problems as before, where you're given P and everything else and asked to find F or where you're given F and everything else and asked to find the present value. So you'll see examples here where you're trying to solve for the future value, and then here where you're trying to solve for the present value. So again, the same kind of problems, the same setup as before, just now a different formula. So you have basically those three formulas, the simple interest, the compound interest, and then the continuous compound interest but all three of them have kind of the same structure with present value and future value, and you can solve for either one of those with any one of the formulas. This last example here is a comparison among different compounding periods, and you can kind of see this play out where everything's the same except how often you compound it. So if you compound interest annually, meaning at the end of each year you add the interest on, you'll have a certain future value, if you compound monthly, it'll be a little bit larger. If you compound daily, it'll be a little bit larger than that. And then if you compound continuously, notice how you have to use the different formula now. But if you compound continuously, it's slightly larger than the compounded daily. Not very much. It's pretty close because the difference between daily and continuously is fairly small. And you can try a similar one like that. There's a couple examples here on doubling time. You can kind of follow through these. For the homework, if you need to do one like this, you can kind of just follow this process. The only thing that's going to change is this interest rate. You might have something other than 0 0.06. You can follow. If you're not familiar with logarithms, then you can uh, read through this. You can look at the algebra review chapter if you want to get a more thorough explanation of logarithms but we don't really need to use them much. So if you want to just uh, run this calculation by following this, these steps, you can do that. And there's a, uh, if you look at the example video here, you can see how to use your calculator to do logarithms like this. There's also a shortcut that gives you an approximate doubling time. It's not as precise as what we just did, but if you take this a uh, side note here and look at, at how to approximate doubling time, you can use that as a shortcut. Then at the end of the section, I basically show you a shortcut to doing all of those calculations. Uh, there's a built-in, it's called a TVM solver, that's the time value of money, and that uh, TVM solver basically can do all these uh, compound interest problems for you. Um, and we'll see later on in other sections when we have slightly different situations, like when we're saving for retirement or calculating mortgages, it can also do those for us. So it's a really handy uh, tool. And you can read through how to work with this. There's also an example that you can click on and watch the video uh, to watch it sort of live being done. But if you find the right button, marked apps, and then enter a couple times. You can enter the TVM solver and then you can read through the description of each of these pieces to fill in. And basically for different types of problems you'll fill in different parts of this and then solve. 
you'll solve for whatever you want to know. If you don't have a TI-83 or TI-84, there's a version that I posted on Blackboard. If you look on Blackboard, on the left, there's a tab marked Calculators, and one of them is a TBM solver, and it's basically a website that has the exact same setup. So it's laid out just like this. You enter the values the same way, and you solve the same way. So if you don't happen to have a TI-83 or 84, you can still use that to do the problems the same way as you would if you had the calculator. So make sure you can you can work with this because for some of the examples that you'll see later um, in other sections, you'll see that it makes life a lot easier than using the formulas. I still think it's a good idea for you to know how to use the formulas, but you can solve the problems, at least for compound interest, this way. If you want to do continuous compound interest, it's a little bit trickier with this, so you might find the formula easier to use, and for simple interest, the same thing, so you may find it easier to use the formula than trying to use this. But for compound interest, you can use that TBM solver. So here's an example you can follow through. You can watch the video for it. You can play around with different examples. What you may want to do is go back to the earlier examples in this section and see if you can do them with the TBM solver just for practice. Then I also show you how to do the same thing using Excel, which you have access to through your FCC account. So if you don't have Excel on your computer, you're able to get to it um, through your FCC student account. Um, so you can definitely use Excel. Or you could use something like Google Sheets or a uh, free version. There are open source programs that do the same kind of thing, just like Excel. But they all have the same kind of formulas. Um, and so I show you how to do the same kind of thing. You have to actually use the formula, but you can work through examples using that as well. And for later sections, I'll also show you how to do other things in Excel in the same way. So I know there's a lot all contained in this section, but make sure you read through it carefully. Make sure you work through the examples carefully, watch any videos you need to, uh, work on the homework, and contact me if you have any questions on any part of that.